When Secretary Johnson was first nominated, some didn't know what to expect, didn't know how, coming from the Defense Department, he would approach the broader Homeland Security mission. Well, today, a uh, little more than a year later, no one would think twice about his leadership. Secretary Johnson has more than won the trust of Washington, of law enforcement around the country, and of his department staff. He's a rock star at this job. He's led DHS through stiff challenges focusing on major strategic priorities like cyber, addressing with compassion the child migrant crisis, and first and foremost, protecting the homeland against a very sophisticated terror threat. The threat we face today is very different from the one that we confronted on September 11. It's less hierarchical, more diffuse, in many ways more innovative. It, that's the new danger. The new jihadists collaborate opportunistically across organizational lines. Some have cyber skills, some have social media savvy. Many are young, many tragically are Western. Our enemies are making dangerous connections in Syria and may soon in Yemen as the country struggles to maintain order. In Ibrahim al Assiri, we face the most talented bomb maker Al Qaeda has ever had and he's targeted Western aviation before. Even if we were to stop every foreign fighter, we're threatened by radicalization at home. Here, DHS operates in a challenging gray area where radical beliefs, which are protected by our Constitution, can become violent action, <clears throat> which is clearly a crime. It's very difficult to find that gray area to intervene. Our society, like all free societies, protects freedom of thought and that includes radical thought. But inspires how to build a bomb in the kitchen of your mom is not, in my opinion, free speech. Stopping the digital spread of dangerous ideologies in partnership with faith communities and law enforcement uh, is as crucial and as difficult <clears throat> as it has ever been. And if all this weren't enough, DHS tackles some of our nation's other thorniest challenges. Immigration, disaster response, just to name two. It's a lot of work on one plate. One of Jay's first trips as Secretary of Homeland Security was to the Port of Los Angeles, uh, which with the Port of Long Beach is the nation's largest container port. Surely the challenges there are huge. I joined him on that visit, my former congressional district, and we did a helicopter flyover. Then the marine layer rolled in and we were unable to land. Uh, what a metaphor for the DHS mission, <laughs> navigating through the fog. Of course, we, <clears throat> we persevered and so has DHS, ably led by Jay Johnson. It's our honor to have him at the Wilson Center for the second time to address the state of Homeland Security. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. I'm staying here. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, good morning, everybody. Good Let's try it again, please. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay. I want to start with a family photograph. Oh, I have to get out. From 1966. You won't believe this. Yes, you want to see this, Jane. Yeah, I do. I do. <clears throat> this is me and my kid sister in 1966. I was eight years old, standing next to my dad's 1966 Buick convertible. The most striking thing about the photograph is that as recently as 1966, a private everyday family of tourists like ours could drive our car onto the grounds of the U.S. Capitol and park it with no inspection or prior notice just a few feet from the building. This is the same spot today. The public parking lot is gone, replaced by a few black suburbans, police vehicles, and heavily armored, heavily armed members of the Capitol Police. Sadly, there are threats to our homeland security today that did not exist in 1966. The department of which I am secretary is responsible for addressing those threats. A year ago, I stood here and spelled out my vision for the Department of Homeland Security. 
I was then new to the job. Now, a year later, I'm here to provide a progress report on our efforts with the benefit of a year's experience. I thank Jane Harmon and the Wilson Center for once again providing me with the forum for this speech. Jane Harmon is a wise supporter, advisor, and mentor. In this town, people like her mean a lot to people like me. We could not govern without you. Thank you and the Wilson Center for everything that you do. On New Year's Day, I wrote out a set of New Year's resolutions for the senior leadership of DHS. At the top of the list were things that go to the manner in which we conduct business and deliver Homeland Security. The reality is that DHS is a very large conglomerate of 22 components that is only 12 years old. We are a, lar we are a large bureaucracy. We are still finding our way, but we are headed in the right direction. First, over the last year, we have filled almost all the senior level vacancies that existed in our department. Just prior to the time I took office a year ago, the Department of Homeland Security had no secretary, no deputy secretary, and vacancies at a number of senior level positions. We now have a secretary, a new deputy secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas, a new undersecretary for National Protection and Programs Directorate, Suzanne Spaulding, a new undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis, General Frank Taylor, a new undersecretary for Science and Technology, Dr. Reggie Brothers, a new Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, Gil Kurlikowski, a new Director of Citizenship and Immigration Services, Leon Rodriguez, a new Assistant Secretary for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Sarah Saldana, a new Chief Financial Officer, Chip Fogum, a new Director, a new Deputy Director, a uh, new Deputy Administrator of FEMA, Admiral Joe Nimich, a new Inspector General, John Roth, a new Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs, Brian DeValance, and a new Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, Tanya Bradshaw. We are actively working through slates of candidates to fill the vacancies that have arisen this past year, a permanent director of the Secret Service and a new administrator of TSA. I see the last one, John Pistol, sitting back there. John, good to see you again. We are restructuring the whole manner in which we make decisions within the Department of Homeland Security. In April, I directed a Unity of Effort initiative, which has brought about a more centralized and integrated process for making budget decisions concerning budget request, acquisition, strategy, and other department functions. We are moving away from decisions made in stovepipes. As part of this initiative, we have created a Joint Requirements Council consisting of senior leaders from the DHS components to identify and recommend investments to maximize efficiency. We have also realigned seven major DHS headquarters functions to consolidate like functions and promote efficiency. Next, as I said here last year, we are committed to greater transparency. Government transparency breeds credibility and confidence. Government secrecy breeds suspicion. One of our executive actions that the President announced on November 20th is to direct our Office of Immigration Statistics to collect maintain and report consolidated DHS-wide data on the number of people we apprehend, remove, return, or repatriate every year in a manner that can be made public. Here again, we've been far too stovepiped in how we collect and report this information. I applaud Chief Fisher back there for making public the Border Patrol's use of force policy last year and Commissioner Kurlikowski for making public the recommendations of the Independent Police Executive Research Forum about use of force by the Border Patrol, two documents long sought by the media. The Deputy Secretary and I are on an aggressive, multifaceted campaign to improve morale within components of DHS. In October of last year, we restored the Secretary's awards program, which has been dormant since 2008, to recognize more than 300 employees who have made outstanding achievements across DHS. Next, DHS is one of 16 departments and agencies on GAO's so-called high-risk list. We are on a path to get off that list soon. Indeed, GAO has informed us that our interactions with it serve as a model for how other federal agencies can work to address 
GAO's high-risk designations. We have improved the department's responsiveness to Congress. This, despite the challenge of, depending on how you count, 92 committees and subcommittees of Congress who claim an oversight role over this department. <laughs> Members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, including some of our biggest critics, have <laughs> taken note of our increased responsiveness. Finally, and this is my favorite one, which I learned about yesterday. Earlier this week, we, we in the judgment of the Center for Plain Language, the Department of Homeland Security has gone from worst to first among federal agencies in our ability to communicate in plain language, one of my personal passions. In these challenging times, management reform is itself a Homeland Security imperative. Now here is where we are on the substance of some of our important missions. I said here a year ago, as long as I'm secretary, counterterrorism will remain the cornerstone of the Department of Homeland Security's mission. Thirteen and a half years after 9-11, it's still a dangerous world. And in 2015, we must recognize that we have evolved to a new phase in the global terrorist threat. Today, the terrorist threat is more decentralized, more diffuse, and more complex. We are concerned about the so-called foreign fighter who leaves his home country, travels to another country to take up the fight there, links up with terrorist extremists, and may return home, whether it's this country or one of our allies, with a terrorist extremist purpose. We are concerned about terrorist organizations' new, slick, and skilled use of the Internet to publicly recruit individuals to conduct attacks within their own homelands. AQAP no longer builds bombs in secret. It has now publicized its instruction manual and has called for people to use it. We're concerned about the domestic-based threat lurking in our midst, the so-called lone wolf, who may become inspired by this extremist propaganda on the internet and who could strike with little or no notice. <clears throat> So what are we doing about this in 2015? First, as everyone knows, we're taking the fight to these groups in places like Iraq and Syria. Our intelligence community continues to detect terrorist plots at their earliest stages. Domestically, the FBI investigates, interdicts, and prosecutes terrorist plots in the homeland. In response to the recent attacks in Paris, Ottawa, Sydney, and elsewhere, and the public calls by terrorist organizations for attacks in the West, I directed that the Federal Protective Service increase its presence at federal buildings in major cities in the United States. We continue to tailor and enhance our security through every appropriate method. For example, the visa waiver program we offer to 38 nations is a valuable tool for international commerce and travel. It is a program that must continue but there are ways in which the security of the program can be improved. To enhance security while maintaining the integrity of the program, last November, we identified added information fields to the Electronic System for Travel Authorization, or ESTA, to learn more about those who travel to the United States from countries <coughs> for which we do not require a visa. We're considering further security enhancements to the program. We are engaging our allies in Europe and elsewhere to encourage them to maintain and share travel information about individuals of suspicion. We are sharing more information and training with state and local law enforcement in this country. Given the manner in which the terrorist threat is evolving, the cop on the beat must be as vigilant as the intelligence analyst. Our efforts must include public engagement. DHS, along with the Justice Department, are engaging communities, organizations, institutions here at home that are themselves in a position to deter others who may be turning toward violence. In 2014, DHS held over 70 of these roundtables, meetings, and other events in 14 cities around the country. I personally participated in these meetings in Chicago, Columbus, Ohio, Minneapolis, Boston, and Los Angeles. We're doubling down on our If You See Something, Say Something campaign. Yesterday at a pre-Super Bowl press conference in Phoenix, I rolled, this out, I rolled out this new enhanced program. 
This must be more than a slogan. Our counterterrorism efforts also include continued vigilance in aviation security. Last summer, I directed that we enhance aviation security at overseas airports with flights directly to the United States. Several weeks ago, TSA made further enhancements, and we're reviewing whether more is necessary. As Secretary, I've made it a DHS priority to establish preclearance by customs and aviation security personnel at overseas airports before a passenger gets on a flight bound for the United States. At present, we have preclearance in 15 overseas airports at which we have screened more than 16 million passengers before they arrive in the United States. The newest of these preclearance operations at Abu Dhabi in the UAE opened early last year. Since that time at Abu Dhabi alone, we've screened 364,000 passengers in that year and crew bound for the United States and denied boarding to 571 individuals including a number who are in the terrorist screening database. We want to build more of these at overseas airports where it makes sense from a homeland security point of view and in a way that U.S. air carriers will support. Last year we put out a solicitation and received 25 letters of interest from airports around the world. We're taking steps to fix our broken immigration system. Some say we should have waited for Congress to act Let's not forget that we did wait for years and Congress did not act. The President continues to urge Congress to finish the job and pass a comprehensive bipartisan immigration bill. He is willing to work with any serious partner, Democrat, Republican, or Independent, who wants to fix the system. In the meantime, we must improve the system within our existing legal authorities. We did that, and the President announced the set of reforms on November 20th of last year. We have established a new program for deferred action for undocumented adults. Those who have committed no serious crimes have been in this country since January 1, 2010 and have children here who are citizens or lawful permanent residents are eligible to be considered for this program. The reality is that these immigrants are not enforcement priorities. Therefore, we want to encourage these people to come out of the shadows, be accountable, pay taxes, and get on the books so we know who they are. Our executive actions also prioritize the removal of felons over families, includes a number of measures to further secure the border, discontinue the Secure Communities Program and replace it with a new program, streamline legal immigration to boost the economy and promote naturalization, support military families and enhance options for foreign-born high-skilled workers, entrepreneurs, and businesses. We're taking a number of steps to further secure the border. I'm on a mission to strengthen border security and to replace public misperception with the facts. In June 2013, Pew Research conducted a survey and asked the following question. Just your best guess, compared with 10 years ago, do you think the number of immigrants entering the U.S. illegally today is higher, lower, or about the same? Amazingly, 55% of respondents answered higher and only 15% answered lower. The reality is on this slide. In the year 2000, apprehensions on the southern border, which are a direct indicator of total attempts to cross the border illegally, exceeded 1.6 million. Apprehensions on the southern border have dropped considerably since then to around 400,000 a year in recent years. Apprehensions are, in fact, at the lowest rate since the 1970s. These numbers are no doubt partially due to economic conditions and trends in the United States, Mexico, and Central America, but are also due to the very large investment this nation has made in border security over the last 15 years. Today's Border Patrol has the largest deployment of people, vehicles, aircraft, boats, equipment along the southern border in its 90-year history. This includes a budget of $3.5 billion, a total of 23,000 personnel, and 20,833 Border Patrol agents. Without a doubt, we had a challenge last summer with the unprecedented number of unaccompanied children and others who crossed a narrow area of our southern border into the Rio Grande Valley in search of a family member and a better life in this country. 
we responded aggressively with more people and resources on the southern border. Beginning in mid-June, the numbers of unaccompanied children crossing the southern border declined sharply and are now at far lower levels. But we are not declaring mission accomplished. The President and I are committed to building an even more secure border and a smart strategy to get there. Much of illegal migration is seasonal. The poverty and violence that are the push factors in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador still exist. The economy in this country, a pull factor, is getting better. There is still more we can and should do. We are pursuing a risk-based strategy for border security. This means focusing resources where our intelligence and our surveillance tell us the threats exist. This is a smart, effective, and efficient use of taxpayer resources. There are more aircraft, surveillance, radar, radar technology, and other equipment that our experts have determined we need, which we've requested for fiscal year 2015. In December, we opened a new family facility in Dilly, Texas that will house up to 2,400 individuals. We are continuing aggressive public awareness messaging in Central America and elsewhere. This Know the Facts campaign was launched on January 5th. On January 21st, I wrote another open letter in Spanish language press to repeat the message. Finally, we've launched a Department of Homeland Security wide southern border campaign plan. We are doing away with the stove-piped approach to border security. Instead, we're putting to use in a combined and coordinated way the assets and personnel of CBP, ICE, CIS, the Coast Guard, toward the goal of border security. We have established three new department task forces, each headed by a senior official of this department, <laughs> to direct the resources of CBP, ICE, CIS, and the Coast Guard in three discrete areas. The first, Joint Task Force East, will be responsible for our maritime ports and approaches across the Southeast. The second, Joint Task Force West, will be responsible for our Southwest land border and the West Coast of California. And the third will be a standing Joint Task Force for investigations to support the work of the other two task forces. A key part of our mission is to facilitate lawful trade and travel. This is vital to commerce in our economy. The President is committed to this. Last year, TSA continued to expand the very popular TSA PreCheck program, which Administrator Pistol spearheaded, enrolling 800,000 new participants. At the same time, TSA screened 653 million total air passengers. 14 million more than the year before, 443 million checked bags, and 1.7 billion carry-on bags. I didn't know that much even existed on this planet. <laughs> Last year, CBP screened 374 million passengers at land, sea, and airports, an increase of 4% from the year before, and enrolled an additional 1.25 million travelers in our various trusted traveler programs to bring total enrollment to 3.3 million members. In 2014, CBP also processed 2.4 trillion in trade, an increase of 4% from the year before, and 25.7 million cargo containers through ports of entry, a 4.5% increase from the year before. We're working with Canada and Mexico on programs and initiatives to facilitate the lawful and secure movement of goods and people between our countries. In response to President Obama's executive order, DHS is leading a 47 agency effort to create a national electronic single window trade processing system for importers and exporters to do business with the United States. We're working to modernize in other areas to promote lawful trade and travel. We need to make strides in cybersecurity. Through our National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, or NCIC, DHS is responsible for assisting and sharing information with the private sector concerning cyber attacks and threats and for securing the civilian.gov networks. I was pleased that last year Congress provided bipartisan support for our efforts with the passage of legislation which codifies DHS's authority to assist the private sector 
codifies DHS's authority to assist other federal agencies and legislation to enhance DHS's ability to hire cyber talent. We need to go further. On January 14th, President Obama came to the NCIC and announced his administration's support for more cybersecurity legislation that will ensure our economic prosperity, national security, and individual civil liberties. We're proposing legislation to encourage the private sector to share cyber threat indicators with the NCIC, protect the private sector with limits on civil and criminal liability when they do, require businesses to notify victims and the government when there is a data breach at that company, and enhance criminal penalties for cyber crime. The Secret Service is the finest protection service in the world. No other agency of any government in the world could protect 135 world leaders all at once when they gather at the UN General Assembly. The Secret Service does this each year with great professionalism and without incident. The Secret Service continues to enjoy the President's trust and confidence as it protects him and his family. It has built tremendous talent and capability to pursue cyber and financial crimes. However, recent events have highlighted the need for change. In October, I appointed an independent panel to take a hard look at the Secret Service. In December, the panel reported its findings back to me. Those recommendations were astute, thorough, and fair. A number of security enhancements have already been made and implemented by Acting Director Clancy. But the Secret Service must also commit to longer term and more systemic change. For my part, I'm committed to sustained and encouraged oversight of the Secret Service to ensure that it has what it needs to get its job done. Last year, our Federal Law Enforcement Training Center trained over 59,000 officers and agents from federal, state, local, and tribal and international law enforcement. The Coast Guard, we're ensuring that the Coast Guard has what it needs to get the job done. These are exciting times for the Coast Guard as it is replacing its aging fleet with new vessels. Four new national security cutters are in service and a fifth will be commissioned this summer. Twelve new fast response cutters have been delivered and are making a difference every day in South Florida and we're more than halfway to completing the replacement of our fleet of agent patrol boats. Meanwhile, the Coast Guard is in the design phase of a new mid-size offshore patrol cutter. I'm committed to ensuring this project is affordable before going forward with the selection of a general contractor and production. FEMA has become the premier emergency management agency in the country and has earned the confidence of federal, state, and local leaders throughout. In the year I've been in office, I have personally had the opportunity to observe this at disaster recovery sites. Finally, DHS cannot pursue all these important missions alone. I cannot print money. I cannot appropriate money. We need a continued partnership with Congress. We need a fiscal year 2015 appropriations bill. At present, DHS is operating on a continuing resolution, which expires on February 27th. As long as we're on a CR, we're restricted to last year's spending levels and cannot engage in any new spending and activities. This means we cannot pay for the added border security that I talked about. This means we cannot invest in the things the independent panel recommended to improve the Secret Service. We cannot hire Secret Service agents for the coming presidential election cycle. This means we cannot fund new non-disaster grants for state and local governments, for mayors, that police chiefs, fire chiefs, and governors that they depend on. Our ability to fund aviation security, maritime security, port security, and homeland security is severely constrained as long as we're on a CR. As originally introduced by the House Appropriations Committee, the fiscal year 2015 appropriations bill for the department was a good bill. It appropriated $39.7 billion for the department and funded many of the things we need. On the House floor, the bill was amended to include politically charged language to defund all of our executive actions to fix the immigration system. The president has vowed to veto any bill that includes such language. 
The clock to February 27 is ticking. In these times, the Homeland Security budget of this government should not be a political football. I urge Congress to pass an appropriations bill for DHS free and clear of politically charged amendments. I will end with the very last two words I ended last year's speech with. Last year, I said that in the name of Homeland Security, we should not sacrifice our values as a nation of people who cherish privacy, freedom, celebrate diversity, and are not afraid. Fear is corrosive. In the final analysis, courage and resolve in the face of challenge are the greatest strengths of any nation. Terrorism cannot advance if we refuse to be terrorized. Whether in response to a terrorist threat, a natural disaster, a deadly virus, or in the pursuit of a more perfect union, courage and resolve will always prevail. Thank you for listening. Well, let me applaud you for the second year in a row, Jay, for that fine ending of your speech. I think it speaks to the values, certainly, of the Wilson Center, and it speaks to the values of people in this room and listening over the airwaves and in overflow rooms in this center and elsewhere. Um, it really does matter that we uh, keep our values as we keep our country safe, and I don't think it's a choice. I think these are. I think it's a positive sum game or a negative sum game. We either do both or we have neither. So let me ask you a few questions. I can't sure. really see that clock around the cameraman, but I think we have about 25 minutes left and I do want to leave time for audience questions. <coughs> um, one more um, uh, comment to this audience. I, I didn't see John Pistol. Where is John Pistol? It's right there. There he is. I don't <laughs> know why I, I would miss him. Um, I just want to applaud you again, John, for your extraordinary service as head of DSA. And I hope, Jay, that when you find his replacement, you pick someone just as tall and just as good. <laughs> so, um, just as cool under fire. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, that too. Right. So last year, you made news in your remarks by saying that Syria is a homeland security threat. Um, you didn't mention Syria today or Yemen or some of these other uh, uh, places in the Middle East that are sadly um, subjected to failing governments. Uh, is Syria still a homeland security threat? I said last year that Syria had become a matter of homeland security and I, I still believe that. And what I was referring to is what I referred to here today. Um, the ability of terrorist organizations to reach into the homeland by use of the internet, by use of social media, uh, the foreign fighter phenomenon, uh, people traveling to Syria and other places to take up the fight there, linking up with extremists and then returning back to their home countries with an extremist mission. That's what I was referring to then and that's what I was talking about now. Well, that segues to a second question and that is about our visa waiver program. Right. Uh, I think most people here remember, I certainly remember why we enacted that program. It has built bridges to many countries. It has created goodwill about America. However, it has recently created fear that some of these so-called foreign fighters who have pledged allegiance to ISIL or Al-Qaeda and have gone into uh, Syria and elsewhere could return on their clean passports to Europe. Most of them come from Europe. Less of them come from the United States, but then go from Europe here. Uh, is the visa waiver program an Achilles heel or are you taking safeguards to assure an anxious public here um, that it is not a loophole for these foreign fighters? Uh, the visa waiver program is an important, valuable program. Uh, there are some out there who want to scrap it. I think that's a mistake. I do believe that <clears throat> there are security enhancements that have been made to the program, that can be made to the program. As I said in my remarks, we added additional data fields for information in the Estes system. And each nation, or almost every nation, that is in our visa waiver program 
uh, signs on to a set of security assurances. Uh, and I've asked my folks to take a hard look at whether um, we're, we're monitoring that, uh, whether there are additional things that we could ask for, uh, whether they're being complied with, and that's, that's under review right now. Um, just a few more questions for me. We have about uh, 18 minutes left here, and I want to observe our time. Um, something you've heard from me over and over again, uh, and many of the rest of you have too, is there's no such thing as 100% security. Right. No matter how good you are, and you are good, and no matter how good the first two rows here are, and they are good, um, something could happen somewhere. Right. So my question is, what are you doing to prepare America for the day after a possible attack? Well, I have a lot of faith in this country. I mean, we, we have agencies, systems in place for emergency response, for disaster response. Um, I have a lot of faith in the, in the character and the culture of this nation in how we respond to crises. I think it is no accident that twice, I think I, think I got it right, twice as many people ran in the Boston Marathon this year as last year in, in light of what happened in 2013. I was there on the finish line, and it was a remarkable experience to be at the Boston Marathon in 2014 after the tragedy of 2013. I was in Manhattan on 9-11, and I was in Manhattan the days after 9-11 and in the New York area to see people who, a lot of people in lower Manhattan got up and went to work the very next day. There are people, former colleagues of mine in the Pentagon, the day after the Pentagon was hit, were at work the very next day at their desk in the E-ring. And so <clears throat> I do not underestimate the character and the courage, and this is what I was referring to, of the American people in responding to a crisis situation. I think that what's incumbent upon us in government service, in national security and homeland security, is to be straight with people about the risk, about the threats. Um, <clears throat> the last the last um, two statements that I put out where I announced the things we were doing to enhance Homeland Security, uh, ramping up the Federal Protection Service and, and aviation security, people, people in the public always, always think when they read things like that, well, what are you not telling me? Yeah. Uh, what, are you, what are you hiding from me? Why are you doing these things? That you're, it, that, what is prompting you to do this that you're not telling me? And what I said in each of those statements, and I, I write them myself because I want to get the tone right, is the reasons for doing this are self-evident. The attacks that occurred, uh, and, and we're referring to Canada and Paris, and the yeah. uh, calls by terrorist organizations for further attacks in the West. So we're not hiding the ball, and I think that it's important for us in Homeland Security to be straight with the public about the situation that we face without scaring people, without encourage, discouraging people from flying, going to the Super Bowl, going to public gatherings. These are things that we all cherish and take for granted in this country. I think it's important that we, we be straight and not be afraid to ask the public for things ask for public participation in our homeland security efforts. And that's one of the reasons why we have this new, if you see something, say something, presentation um, that we rolled out yesterday for the Super Bowl. It's gonna be all over the Super Bowl, all over the stadium. And <clears throat> it's like the very expensive painting you probably have in your house, Jane. You hang it there and you He's stop looking at house. it after a while. Uh -huh. And, but then if you, if you put a new frame on it, or you move it around, you say, wow, that's really a nice painting, and you start looking at it again and admiring it again. That's what I want people to do with the if you see something, say something message. And we, so we were, were representing it to the American public. Well, so. just to comment on resilience, there was a lovely photo on the evening news last night of a guy in the back bay of Boston shoveling the snow off of the finish line of the Boston Marathon. His point was this should not be covered up. Boston is strong and 
what a what a powerful message. So let me end my questions. Get ready, folks, with with one about uh, the Super Bowl. Why wouldn't I do that? Um, <laughs> you you said that Homeland Security should not be a political football. So let's ask about football. Um, I'm not sure how much you can tell this audience about. Uh, the, the precautions for the Super Bowl. You wouldn't tell me whether you're going. I guess it's classified. But I was there yesterday. Ah. Uh, but can you reassure the public that precautions are being taken? And I'm giving yes. you a chance to offer any comments you want about deflated footballs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stay away from deflated footballs. I'm going to stay away from expressing any preference. None of my teams made any, got anywhere close to the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> Um, and I was there yesterday, um, saw firsthand the marvelous cooperation and partnership that the federal government has with um, Arizona State Public Safety, with the Glendale Police Department, the Phoenix Police Department, I uh, met with the governor, and uh, it's a marvelous partnership. It seems to be working seamlessly. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that we've taken tremendous precautions uh, for the Super Bowl. Uh, there are magnetometers everywhere. We're screening all the people who come into the stadium, including workers. Uh, we're screening all the vehicles that get within a certain distance of the stadium. And so I, I encouraged at a press conference there yesterday um, that, we, that I'm confident that we'll have a, a safe and successful game. Well, if somebody asked me, what do you fear most about the Super Bowl? I said, overtime. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's warmer weather there, than, uh, so the ball should not inflate, deflate. Uh, questions from the I'm, audience. I'm, done, I'm not going there. Uh, please identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, we'll hear your comments at another forum, but please just ask a question. Yes, in the corner right here. Mr. Secretary, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Sobrowski Institute out at the Naval Postgraduate School. Art Sobrowski, as you probably know, is sort of the leading light on information technology. I'm working on a project with the Naval Academy on trying to, to expand the knowledge of the threats of information technology without making everyone feel the way I felt as a child. I had to dive under a chair. Yeah. Ask your question. Well, Missy. my question is, how do you tell that story to let everyone understand how tenuous we are in terms of what can go wrong? Everything from, I mean, I, when we started working at this, sh guns that could just put out a... a right. an, Thank you. Yeah, got I mean, it. You get the idea. Okay. I, I think that, um, this goes back to what I said before, I think we have an obligation to be straight with the American people and realistic. And when we present challenges and threats, I think we also have to present the solutions, too. So when we talk about the terrorist threat globally, I also want to talk about in the next paragraph, here's what we're doing about it. Mm -hmm. And go through the things that we're, we're, you know, okay, it's good to bring the public the problem, but I think we owe the public the solutions as well. And I'm not... I'm not of the uh, school of thought that you just tell the public about all the threats without also telling the public about, okay, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I, I think that's key. Question over here. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my name is Bassam Barabandi. I'm from Syrian American Council. We are the largest Syrian American organization in the United States. We are covering 13 states. We would like to thank your department about everything they are doing with the Syrian. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I just handed your protocol guys a letter from the Syrian American community saying, we would like to be partner with you. The extremist is our enemy. Uh, I know Syria is focal point for all the terrorists. We, it's our enemy as much as your enemy. We are all from the same nation. And we are looking forward to work more with your department. That's Thank you. Uh, Earlier, uh, last year, when I was in, um, when I was in a Chicago suburb, I visited a, 
um, with leaders in the Syrian American community. I was impressed by the cohesiveness of the community. And um, I've been doing a number of engagements in the community around the country, as I mentioned, um, to talk to people about <coughs> their issues with the department, talk to them about public awareness, public participation in their efforts, and I want to continue to do that. So thank you for your comments. In, in, the, in the far back, uh, last, last row, then we'll go to you. Hi, um, my name is Tara McKelvey. I'm with the BBC. I'm wondering if you can tell me about the um, conference that's planned in February on countering violent extremism and cooperation that you have with UK officials or with people in other countries. Well, I'm going to the UK next week uh, to meet with uh, several of my counterparts. And I suspect that one of the things that will be on our agenda is ways in which we can engage the community further in our respective countries. We've had that conversation. Uh, <clears throat> one of my engagements, I believe this one was the one in Columbus, Ohio, um, a mayor from Belgium was actually where with me. He wanted to see how we do it here in this country. And so that's a level of international discussion that I think is becoming all the more important. As the homeland security challenges we have evolve, to a more domestic-based uh, type of challenge, I think it becomes all the more important that we have these community engagements, uh, that we partner with state and local law enforcement, and we encourage public participation in our efforts. So, If I could just add a follow-up question to that. Uh, one of the differences, at least it's, it's, it's alleged, between France and us is that we have made a lot of effort to assimilate right. communities, especially Muslim communities in the United States. The comments from uh, our friend from Syria, from the Syrian organization, are, are evidence of that. Um, are more efforts planned? Are, are you planning more? Or are most of these happening at the local law enforcement uh, level? I'm certainly aware that in Los Angeles there is a number of these efforts that are quite successful. Well, we're, we're definitely planning more. We've <laughs> ramped up our efforts in the last year. The Department of Justice, the FBI is doing the same thing. I think it's what, what happens when I do these things is <clears throat> I'll, I'll go to a city and the county sheriff will be there, the police, area police chiefs will be there, a couple of members of Congress will be there, and community leaders will be there. And in the Muslim community, uh, I've learned a lot from these engagements, in the Muslim community, <clears throat> they have a lot of issues with airport profiling, mm -hmm. uh, how we administer our immigration laws, uh, they tell me about some of the discrimination that they face, which always spikes after an attack overseas. Um, some of the issues that even their children face going to school. And, you know, I really feel for these people. What I say back to them is, I hear you and I know that there are things that we should work on in my department, but I want to ask you to do something, which is, it's all of our homelands and it's our public safety, your public safety, we all have a vested interest in it. And so we want to see you build bridges with my department, with this sheriff, with this chief, um, this mayor, this assemblyman, this, this member of the county legislature here, uh, so that if you see trouble in your community, uh, you'll, you'll think to, to contact one of us. Well, that works. There's a lot of evidence that that works. Question in the back over here. It, you. Hi, Catherine. Oh, oh, uh, oh, Catherine. Well, all right, and then we'll go behind you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> fine. <clears throat> Can you use the mic better, please? Hello, Catherine. Hi there. We're still not hearing you. I bet Catherine knows how to shout. I bet she does, but then she won't be heard over the airwaves if she doesn't use the mic. And she's an important voice, so we need her heard. All right, let's use the other mic, please. Okay. 
Thank you for your patience. Jane, thank you for hosting today's event. Secretary Johnson, uh, has the Paris massacre emboldened AQAP and ISIS, and does this make the likelihood of a similar style attack in the U.S. more likely? And a second question, the FBI has been throwing around this figure of 100 Americans in Syria for the better part of a year. Is that still the figure you're working off of, or has it gone up? Thank you. Well, first of all, I will not try to uh, surmise the, the mindset of AQAP leaders. I do believe that the attacks in Europe, plus the calls for further attacks in the West uh, by these groups, means that here in the United States we have to be vigilant. Uh, vigilant in looking out for similar attacks here in the United States, which is one of the reasons we've, we've made the enhancements in homeland security that we've made in the last several weeks and months. I think it's a rather obvious thing to do and I think it's necessary. And so, um, and what I was saying before, I mean, there's, there's, there's no, there are no secrets here. Um, these groups are operating in the open uh, they're calling for these attacks, they're calling for independent actors to commit these attacks. And so we've got to be vigilant, we've got to be working with, you know, the NYPD, with the, with major sh chiefs and sheriffs around the country um, to share information. One of the functions of our intelligence and analysis directorate is vertical intelligence and information sharing. I think that's become all the more important given the current challenges that we face, and so I and I said that to a group of, of mayors and of, of uh, sheriffs and chiefs earlier this week. Um, look, the numbers. The numbers. What I'll say about the numbers is that I think that we in the FBI do a reasonably good job of tracking people who are going to Syria, going anywhere near Syria, attempting to go to Syria to take up the fight there. You, always, you don't know what you don't know, but given the systems that we have in place, I think we do a reasonably good job of tracking these people as they travel and as they may return. Um, the bigger challenge are the European countries. They have, as Jane said, much bigger numbers, which is why I think we also need to be vigilant when it comes to travel from countries for which we do not require a visa. And so looking at the security assurances that go along with participating in the visa waiver program is something that I've asked my folks to do. It's an important program, we should maintain it, um, but it's, it's something that we, we should focus on. Well, let me say that, um, you know, as I, I said in my opening remarks, people weren't sure how a DOD guy was gonna adapt to the Homeland Security mission. And then when you said you had a slideshow, I started to shudder. <laughs> <laughs> and then I watched the slideshow with little Jay and his sister in front of a uh, Capitol where, uh, as I tell I my, I tell my staff over and over again, <laughs> one message per slide, please. Yeah. Not seven, or not 20. But mm -hmm. what I want to point out is the close of the slideshow, which showed Masses of people around the world with that not afraid sign uh, standing up for freedom. And the last slide, if I remember it right, because I was sitting right there, was Selma. Mm -hmm. And it is the 50th anniversary of Selma uh, in a few weeks, and the big crowd will be going down there um, to celebrate the fact that uh, we achieved, not perfectly, but we achieved more equality in the United States. And I, I just want to say to you, Jay, uh, that there won't be 100% security, something bad will happen, but it is very reassuring to many of us to have you as the face of Homeland Security and to have you speak honestly, including about the problems uh, with the mission going forward. There will be problems, certainly Congress is a problem, um, but I'm hopeful that with good leadership and uh, uh, a, a, an increased morale at your department, that our country will be safer, and I'm confident too that with the kind of leadership you offer, that our country will be freer. Thank you for coming back. Next year is going to be speech number three. Promise me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you all. <laughs>